Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Michele Pansini and I will give you lessons of fundamentals of chemistry. First of all, I would like to give you the name of a textbook, uh, The Molecular Nature of Matter and Its Transformation. I made a mistake, its transformation. The author is Martin Silberberg. Uh, well, this course, uh, the name is Fundamentals of Chemistry, and I will talk about the main topics of chemistry so that they are useful in whatever field of engineering. Uh, I briefly summarize the content of this course. First of all, I will begin starting from the fundamental laws of chemistry, namely the Lavoisier law, Proust law, Dalton law. Then uh, I will talk about uh, the theory, the atomic theory of matter. Then I will uh, come into, come inside the atom and we will study something about the structure of the atom. Structure of the atom that will be studied very superficially because uh, the structure of atom is very, very complicated matter. And we will study only what is useful to understand the chemical behaviors of the various elements. Then we will be talking about the chemical bond, the various type of chemical bond, and about the classification of the various chemical elements. Then we will be talking about the concept of chemical reaction and uh, the related topics regarding the energy release or the energy that, that, that is absorbed during the chemical reaction. Then we will talk about the uh, physical state of the matter, the, the feature of the physical state of the matter, namely the physical, the gaseous state, the solid state, the liquid states, and then we will be talking about the liquid system that are not composed by only one compound, but by more than one compound, namely the solution. Then we will study the kinetics of the chemical reaction, namely the velocity of the various chemical reaction. Then we will be studying the equilibrium of chemical reaction, namely some chemical reaction does not go to completion. It seems that this reaction stops and we will understand why it seems that this reaction stops. Finally, we'll be talking about the equilibrium in liquid solution, Nam namely we'll be talking about acid and base. Finally, the last, the last chapter of this course uh, will concern the electrochemistry, namely the chemical system in which uh, electric current is produced and this electric current may be used to attain some particular goal, for example, a pile, namely the battery of your computer or the battery of your mobile phone is an electrochemical device. And uh, uh, in, in electrochemistry, we will be studying also the possibility of charge again a battery, namely, when you use your computer or when you use your mobile, uh, you, um, when you use a long time, the battery is off, is discharged. To charge again the battery, we will allow to connect the battery to a font of electrical current and the electrical current uh, will uh, give rise to chemical reaction which allow the battery to be charged again and to be used again. Well, uh, now I'm going to uh, talk to the about the first lesson of this, uh, of this course of chemistry. In this first lesson, we will start from about zero. I will not ask you for having no previous knowledge of chemistry. We will be starting just by the fundamental law of chemistry. Well, chemistry 
is concerned about matter and about the ability of matter to undergo transformation. Well, I was telling you that the chemistry is concerned about the ability of matter and the ability of transformation of matter. First of all, what is matter? What matter is? Matter is whatever our sense perceive. Namely, is matter the air that we breathe? Is matter the water that we drink? Is matter the wood of which is composed this desktop? Is matter the ceramic of which is done the floor of this room? Whatever is matter. Well, matter is characterized by mass. Um, mass is a scalar uh, um, quantity, namely is a quantity that is characterized only by a number. And uh, in chemistry you can also confuse mass with weight, because what is important in chemistry is to uh, um, uh, to find a particular quantity of matter and define with precision the amount of matter that you are considering. Now it is not important if you define the quantity of matter by using the mass or by using the weight is absolutely the same. In physics the confusion between weight and the confusion between mass is a serious mistake in chemistry. It does not. It is not important. So, in, the, in following this course, I will talk in the same way of mass and of weight. The important thing is to exactly define the amount of matter to which we refer. The matter may be found in three different states solid state, liquid state, aeriform state. In the solid state is characterized by having its sound, shape and volume. And in the solid state, particles of which the solid is composed are uh, close to each other and are ordered. Namely, you can find a long range order in the solid state. In liquid state, Liquid has its sound volume, but the shape of the vessel that contains it. You know, this difference is caused by the fact that uh, the interaction between the particles of solid and the particles of liquid are different. So, the interaction between the particles that compose solid state are stronger than the interaction between the particles that made the liquid states. So in the solid state, so the solid state may keep its own volume and its own shape. Whereas in the liquid state, the liquid has its own volume, but the nose does not have its own shape, and it assumes the shape of the vessel in which the liquid is contained. Well, the higher reform state has the volume and the shape of the vessel that contains it. You know, I deliberately used the, the location higher reform, because higher reform encompasses gas and vapor. As we will see along this course, we will see that gas and vapor are strongly different from each other. So I refer to gas or vapor. At the moment, I don't have the possibility of uh, uh, explaining the difference between a gas and a vapor. We will see in the next lesson. Then, uh, matter may undergo physical transformation. What does it mean, Miss Physical Transformation? It means that it changes only the physical state in which matter is found. Namely, if we have water, water at room temperature is liquid. But if we froze water below zero degree, it becomes ice, so it becomes solid. 
but we know also that water may evaporate and may release in the atmosphere gaseous molecules. So, the transformation in which a compound goes from a solid, from a state of the matter to another state is a physical transformation. It's not a chemical transformation as in liquid water, in ice and in water vapor, the uh, unity that, comp that compose this kind of matter are always water molecules. You know, in water molecules we have one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atom. And these molecules are the same uh, when the water is liquid, when the water is solid and so is ice, and also when the water is vapor. Okay? Let's see the, uh, the state transition. Well, I was talking about physical transformation. The change of the physical state are physical transformation. In this, uh, uh, in this drawing is uh, summarized the various physical transformation that may occur. The transformation from solid to liquid is called fusion or melting. The transformation from liquid to solid is called solidification or freezing. The transformation from liquid to aeriform is called evaporation. The transformation from aeriform to liquid is called condensation. But it should be also said that there is the possibility of having the direct transformation of solid to aeriform and to aeriform, from aeriform to solid. The transformation from solid to aeriform is called sublimation. For example, I don't know if you uh, know naphthalene. Naphthalene is a chemical compound that is used to uh, keep in a droning, in a droner, uh, some uh, clothes or something like this. And when you put the clothes in the drawer, you put also some naphthalene inside. When after the summer has gone by, you take again these clothes, you do not find the small bowl of naphthalene, because the bowl of naphthalene has sublimized. And the, 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 the reason why you pass from solid to aeriform is not possible to explain in this moment of the course. Um, well, there is also the possibility of going from aeriform to solid. For example, uh, this uh, uh, state transition is called frosting. Uh, you know, I make an example of frosting in this moment. When uh, you open a freezer, the freezer is kept at a temperature of about minus 20 degrees. The humid air comes into the freezer and the water that is, that is contained in the air, when it comes into the freezer, goes directly from the gaseous state, the air reform state, to the solid states. And it forms a sort of powder, of icy powder, that deposes over the surface, or the inner surface of the freezer. This is the brain. Okay? When you pass your hand over this brain, it immediately dissolves and becomes liquid. You know, the difference between ice and brain is that ice is compact. Brain is a sort of powder composed by small crystal of solid that have been formed by the frosting of the water that was in the aeriform state to the solid state. 
Then it must be said that matter may be formed by many, many kinds of atoms. And the various chemical substances are sorted into two different groups. The elementary substances, called also elements, in which all the entities that compose the matter are all equal, and the compound in which the entities that compose the matter, namely the atoms, are different from each other. Okay. However, there are transformation of the matter that are deeper than the transformation that the state transition, and these are the chemical reaction. Well, let's give some example of chemical reaction. As an example, when you cook a slice of meat, the cooking of a slice of meat, a series of chemical reaction undergoes into the meat. For example, when a steel device is exposed to the humid air, it is covered by a layer of rust. When a, um, a device, a, a steel device is covered by rust, this is a chemical reaction. Or for example, when you uh, light a fire, namely you burn the methane or that the, uh, that goes to your kitchen and methane burns with the oxygen of air, this is a chemical reaction. Um, up to now, we have been talking about uh, some qualitative aspect of the chemical reaction. Let's see some quantitative aspect of this chemical reaction. And uh, let's have a look to this drawing that I'm uh, showing in this moment. Look, this is a vessel, namely a glass, something like this, in which is contained an aqueous solution of sodium chloride. You know, sodium chloride is the main compound that is present in the kitchen salt that you use to give a salty taste to the meal that you eat. And this odor is another glass, another vessel, in which there is a solution of another compound, that is uh, silver nitrate. You know, silver nitrate is a ionic solid, and uh, when you put in contact with water, it dissolves and it gives rise to a solution of silver nitrate. You know, these two solutions are perfectly transparent and limpid. Then, in a uh, subsequent stage of the reaction, you empty these two vessels, these two glasses, into just one vessel. Namely, you mix the solution of sodium chloride with the solution of silver nitrate. When the two solutions mix with each other, you suddenly see that the solution that forms by the mixing of these two solutions becomes immediately white. It becomes white because there was a precipitation reaction occurring between the silver of silver nitrate and the chloride of sodium chloride, namely a uh, insoluble salt, which is silver chloride, uh, chloride precipitated. This salt is white, and so everything becomes white. Namely, a chemical reaction has occurred. The chemical reaction is the precipitation of an insoluble salt, silver chloride, from the mixing of two solutions of two soluble salt, namely sodium chloride and silver nitrate. You know, if you perform this reaction over the plate of a balance, you will see that no variation of weight, namely no variation of mass, has occurred. 
if you repeat this kind of experiment for whatever chemical reaction, you will always see that in the course of a chemical reaction, the mass of the system does not change. Namely, the mass of the substances which begins the reaction, namely the reactants, is equal to the mass of the product that are generated by the reaction, okay? And um, it should be said that there would be some reaction in which this law of conservation of the mass is not respected. As an example, if you burn a candle, you have the feeling that the mass of the, city, of the system goes decreasing during the reaction, because at the beginning the candle is tall like this. At the end of the reaction the candle is low like this. You say the mass of the system has decreased. It is not so, because the candle is composed by paraffin. Paraffin means that there are hydrocarbon that at room temperature are in the solid states. When the candle burns, these hydrocarbons transforms into carbon dioxide and water vapor that are loosed in the atmosphere. So you have the feeling that the mass of the system is decreasing, but if you have the possibility of keeping into the reacting system the carbon dioxide and water that is produced by the reaction, the mass of the system will not change. Okay? So we can say that the first fundamental chemistry of law is the law of the conservation of the mass. Said also Lavoisier law from the name of the scientist, the French scientist who discovered this law which may be said in the following way. In a closed chemical system, the sum of the mass of substances reacting among them, namely the reactants, is equal to the sum of the mass that are formed during the reaction, namely the products of reaction. The second fundamental law of chemistry. Let us consider three different samples of the same chemical substances, sodium chloride. You know, and we have the, we pay attention to pay three different samples of sodium chloride that exhibit a completely different origin. Namely, sodium chloride may be produced by evaporating the seawater, or sodium chloride may be uh, obtained from the outcrop of rock salt, or if you want, sodium chloride may be synthetically produced by reacting the gaseous chlorine with the metallic sodium. If these three different samples of sodium chloride are chemically analyzed, the results of the chemical analysis in all the three cases of the three different samples of sodium chloride give this result. The result is that for one gram of sodium, there are always be bound 1.54 grams of chloride, which in terms of percentage, we can say that in 100 grams of sodium chloride, there are 39.3 grams of sodium and 60.7 grams of chloride. So, if you repeat this experiment for many, 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 many other substances, you will have always the same result. For example, if you do this same experiment for calcium carbonate, calcium carbonate, we see that over 100 grams of calcium carbonates, there are 40 grams of calcium, 12 grams of carbon, 
48 grams of oxygen. And if we take a calcium carbonate coming from limestone, which is a rock which is very diffused all over the world, or if we say the calcium carbonate obtained by the reaction of calcium chloride and sodium carbonate, we will have that the result of the chemical analysis will be exactly the same. So, generalizing this concept, we can say that when two or more elements combine among them to form a particular compound, they combine, they combine according to weight proportion that are definite and constant. This is the formulation of the law of definite proportion, such as Proust, the scientist who discovered this law, he pronounced it exactly in this way. Okay? Well, let's see the third law of the um, of the, of, uh, the third fundamental law of chemistry. Let's have a look to the, the data that now I'm going to show on this blackboard. You know, carbon and oxygen forms two different type of compound. One is called carbon monoxide and the other one is called carbon dioxide. Let's see the uh, value of the chemical of the chemical analysis of so these two different compounds. Um, if we express the result of the chemical compound in terms of percentage, we have that in carbon monoxide, over 100 grams of carbon monoxide, there are 42.86 grams of carbon, and the rest, namely 57.41 are grams of oxygen. Whereas, as far as carbon dioxide is concerned, we have that over 100 grams of carbon dioxide, 27.27 27 are grams of carbon, and the rest that are 72.73 grams are oxygen. Well, these data do not tell us anything at all. What is very interesting is to see the result of the chemical analysis in this other form. Look at this. Here we report the value of the mass of oxygen, which is bound to the same mass of carbon. As a mass of carbon, we got 1.000 mass of carbon. And chemical analysis tell us that to 1.000 grams of carbon, there are 1.333 grams of oxygen. This occurs in carbon monoxide. These are the result of the chemical analysis in carbon monoxide. As far as carbon dioxide is concerned, we have that the mass of oxygen, which is bound to one gram of carbon, is two grams point six six six. Okay? Then let's do another very, very simple operation. We see that we, we take the two mass of oxygen. And we divide the higher mass, 2.666, by the smaller mass, 1.333. Result is 2. Namely, is this a whole number? You know, this fact, it may be a case, but it is a case that appears a little bit strange. Okay? Namely, Look at this what has occurred in carbon monoxide and in carbon dioxide. It occurred that the ratio 
between the mass of one element that is bound to the same mass of the other element is given by a wall number. You know, it may be a case. So, let's see another example. And the other example that we do is a very, very interesting example. Is the example uh, in which we consider all the compound that nitrogen N makes with oxygen O. And we have four different compounds that are formed by nitrogen and oxygen. Let's see what are these compounds. These compounds, the name are dinitrogen oxide, nitrogen oxide, dinitrogen trioxide, nitrogen dioxide, dinitrogen pentoxide. You know, uh, in the following lesson, we will be we will explain how to give a name to a chemical compound when this chemical compound is characterized by a formula. At the moment, do not worry about the name of this chemical compound. You must just consider that nitrogen and oxygen makes five different compounds. So, let's see the data of the chemical analysis of these five different compounds. The chemical analysis expressed in terms of percent say that in dinitrogen oxide, in 100 gram of dinitrogen oxide, we have 63.7 grams of nitrogen and 36.3 grams of oxygen. In nitrogen oxide, we have 46.74 grams of nitrogen and 53.26 grams of oxygen. In dinitrogen trioxide, we have 36.91 grams of nitrogen and 63.09 grams of oxygen. In the nitrogen dioxide, we have 30 grams per 49 grams of nitrogen and 69.51 grams of oxygen. Then we have in dinitrogen pentoxide, we have 25.99 grams of nitrogen and 74.01 grams of oxygen. As in the previous case, we find that these data of the chemical analysis expressed in terms of percentage does not tell us everything. But let's see, let's present the data of the chemical analysis in a slightly different shape. Namely, we report the mass of oxygen which is bound to the same mass of nitrogen. The mass of nitrogen is one gram. We see that the mass of oxygen, which is bound to one gram of nitrogen in dinitrogen oxide is 0 0.57 gram. The mass of oxygen that is bound to one gram of nitrogen in nitrogen oxide is 1.14. The mass of oxygen which is bound to one gram of nitrogen in dinitrogen trioxide is one gram 709. The mass of oxygen which is bound to one gram of nitrogen in nitrogen dioxide is 2.28 grams. And finally, the mass of oxygen, which is bound to one gram of nitrogen in the dinitrogen pentoxide, is 2.849. Now, let's do the same simple operation that we have been doing in the previous case. Namely, 
we take all this number, all this mass of oxygen, and we divide all this mass of oxygen by the smallest mass of oxygen, which is 0 0.57. In the first case, namely in the case of the nitrogen oxide, we have that 1.40 divided by 0 0.57 gives us a result 2. In the second case, the ratio between the mass of oxygen, which is 1.709, divided by 0 0.57, it gives about 3. In the fourth case, we have that the mass of oxygen, which is 2.28 divided by 0 0.57, gives as a result about 4. Finally, in dinitrogen pentoxide, dividing the mass of oxygen, 2.849, by the smallest mass of oxygen, 0 0.57, gives us a result 5. You know, if the result is not perfectly a whole number, it means just that the chemical analysis is an operation done by man, so it is affected by an error. Okay? If the chemical analysis were perfect, these are whole numbers. So, Generalizing the consideration that we have, that we may draw from considering this data, we can say that uh, we can draw the multiple proportion law, which is formulated by Dalton. The multiple proportion law says when two elements combine to form different compounds, the ratio of the weight amounts of an element that combines with the same weight amount of another element are expressed by whole number. This law was formulated by Dalton at the end of 70, begin of 80, something like this. Well, Always Dalton considered the Lavoisier law, considered the Proust law, considered its sound law, namely the law of conservation of the mass, the law of definite proportion, the law of multiple proportion, and we saw that uh, Dalton was able to produce his theory, atomic theory of matter. The atomic theory of matter is expressed in the following five points. And the atomic theory of matter, as was expressed by Dalton, is considered also today valid, except in one point that in a few minutes, I will be going to show you. Look at this. The five points of which is composed the atomic theory of matter of Dalton say that, the first, matter is composed by very small particles called atoms. The atom is the small part of an element. The atoms of the same elements are equal and have the same mass or the same weight, which is about the same thing. But atoms of different elements are different and have different mass, namely different weight. Chemical reaction occurs occur between whole atoms and not between fraction of atoms. Well, the fourth point of the atomic theory of matter formulated by Dalton says that 
chemical reaction occur between wall atoms and not between fractional atoms. Finally, the fifth point of the atomic theory of matter says that the atoms of the various elements keep their identity and are not destroyed during the chemical reaction. Look, the only point in which the atomic theory of uh, matter by Dalton fails is that according to Dalton, atoms cannot be shared anymore. It is not true at all, because we will see in the next few lessons that there are small particles that the atom is composed by various particles that are smaller than the atoms itself. But Dalton, the experiments about the origin, the the, the, the origin of the atoms uh, began in the beginning of 90 and Dalton formulated this atomic theory of matter at the, begin, at the beginning of 80, so about one century before. Now let's see how this atomic theory of matter is perfectly consistent with the three fundamental law of chemistry. Namely, the atomic theory may uh, interpret correctly the three fundamental law of chemistry. And so the um, atomic theory of matter is perfectly consistent with the three fundamental law of chemistry. Look at this drawing. I represented in this drawing one atom of carbon with a circle with a sphere blue. Whereas I pointed a oxygen atom with a white, with an empty circle. Okay? And a molecule, a particle of carbon monoxide is represented by putting together one atom of carbon and one atom of oxygen. Okay? If we take instead of one atom of carbon, an atom of carbon, and instead of one atom of an oxygen, an atom of oxygen, we have the formation of n particles of carbon monoxide. Okay? If we calculate the ratio between the mass of carbon, which is in a, mo in a particle, in only one particle of carbon monoxide, we have to divide the mass of one carbon atom divided by the mass of one oxygen atom. If we perform the same operation in this second case, we have to divide the mass of n carbon atom by the mass of n oxygen atom. N and N may be eliminated and remain only mass of one carbon atom divided by mass of one oxygen atom. So this simple operation makes us sure that the law or proust of the definite proportion is always respected. Look. If you take a different number of carbon atom, different from the number of oxygen, we take n atom, n carbon atom, and we take n small plus uh, n big oxygen atom, we have that n small particles of carbon 
monoxide are formed, and the remaining big hand number of oxygen atom remain uncombined. So, the, if we put more oxygen of the necessary, the oxygen in excess will not combine, and so the carbon monoxide that forms even in this condition will be equal to the carbon monoxide that forms when the right amount of oxygen was present related to the amount of the carbon that was initially present. Okay? Then, look at this. If the reacting system we put N carbon atom and we put oh, sorry, we put one carbon atom and we put two oxygen atom, we have the formation one particle of carbon dioxide in which there are one carbon atom and two oxygen atom. So if we want to calculate the ratio of the mass of oxygen that is bound to the same mass of carbon in carbon dioxide and in carbon monoxide, we have to divide the mass of two carbon atom in carbon dioxide by the mass of one carbon atom in carbon monoxide. The mass of two carbon atom divided by the mass of one carbon atom make always two. And these make us sure that the law of the multiple proportional Dalton it is always respected. Okay? Finally, the fifth point of the atomic theory of matter makes us sure that the law of Lavoisier of the conservation of the mass is always respected. Namely, the fifth point says that the atoms of the various elements keep their identity and are not destroying during the chemical reaction. So, if during the chemical reaction the atoms are not created nor are destroyed, they keep their identity, so they will also keep their mass. So the mass of all the atoms that are present at the beginning of the reaction, namely the mass of the reactants, must be equal to the mass of the atoms that are present at the end of the reaction, namely the mass of the product of the reaction, which makes us sure that the laws of the conservation of mass is always respected. You know, the fact that the atomic theory of matters is able to interpret perfectly the three fundamental law of chemistry that are experimental law, namely the result of physical experiment, makes us sure that this theory is a right one. Okay. Well, something more must be said that uh, in nature exists the, princi the principle of the conservation of the mass is declared by the law of conservation of the mass. But there is also another principle, the principle of the conservation of energy. The principle of conservation of energy may be expressed in this form. In nature, energy is not created nor destroyed but it transforms from one kind into another kind of energy. You know, the principle of the conservation of the reaction is perfectly depicted in thermodynamics and is the first principle of the thermodynamics. The first principle of the thermodynamics says that the variation 
of the energy of the system is equal to the difference between the heat that we give to the system minus the work that you get out, that you can take away from the system. This is the formulation of the first principle of thermodynamics, which is, was formulated by the researcher of thermal machine of the 18th century in England. And I use this same way of expressing the first principle so, in chemistry, you must consider the law of the conservation of the mass and the law of the conservation of the energy. Nevertheless, it should be said that one should not talk about the law of the conservation of the mass and the law of the conservation of the energy, because Einstein showed through his very famous equation that mass may transform into energy, so destroying a small, small, small amount of mass, it may give rise to an enormous amount of energy. And uh, on the contrary, an enormous amount of energy may materialize into a small amount of mass. And this is what occurs in nuclear transformation. Namely, there are atoms that are unstable. These atoms are unstable and decompose into more stable atoms. And by decomposing into more stable atoms, they lose a part of their mass, and this part of their mass is transformed into energy. You know, uh, in this course, we will not study nuclear transformation. Namely, we will not study transformation in which an atom transforms into another atom because it is unstable. So we will be able to say that the principle of the conservation of the mass and the principle of the conservation of the energy is always respected. However, if we want to consider the nuclear transformation, we have only one principle, which is the principle of the conservation of the mass and the energy together. Namely, if you don't find any more mass into a reacting system, it means that the energy of the system has increased, as well as if you do not find a part of the energy in this system, it means that a part of this energy has materialized into mass. Anyway, I'm telling it just to tell you that it may occur, but in this elementary course of chemistry, we will not be studying any nuclear transformation, namely transformation in which a mass transforming into energy, of our energy transforming into a mass. Okay, understood. Now I would like to end this lesson by introducing some other quantity which are very important in chemistry. First of all, we say that atoms are very, 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 very small. The Unit mass is the gram, and the gram is too big to weigh an atom, because the atom is very, very small and it is very, very light. You know, uh, the, uh, the mass by which, the, 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 the unit by which the mass of the atom is measured is, is, is named unit atom mass and is uh, defined to be equal to one twelfth of the mass of the carbon atom. 
You know, originally, the unit mass was set equal to the mass of the smallest atom, namely the mass of the hydrogen atom. Then uh, the scientists preferred to use one twelfth of the carbon atom, which is about equal to the mass of the hydrogen atom. Now, in this moment, I don't have the possibility to explain why the scientist that took this decision had some reason in taking this decision. I will be able to explain it in the following lesson. But we can say that the unit mass atom, the unit atom mass, is about equal to the mass of the lightest atom, which is the atom of hydrogen. We cannot say that it is the mass of the hydrogen because it is defined to be one twelfth of the carbon atom. But one twelfth of the carbon atom is practically equal to the mass of the lightest atom, which is the hydrogen atom. Then let's see, let's calculate the ratio between the unit mass gram and the unit atom mass. You know, the unit atom mass, when it is expressed in, in, um, in uh, grams, is equal to 1.66 per 10 at minus 24. If we perform this operation, we obtain this number, 7.023 per 10 at 23. <laughs> well, uh, now it does not appear in this, uh, in this, uh, in, in, in this blackboard because when I uh, made the PDF, it has not taken this number. So consider that this number is 6.023 multiplied by 10 elevated at 23. This number is called the Avogadro number and is uh, pointed by this particular n made in this way. So, defining the Avogadro number in this way, what does it appear? It appears as if that the Avogadro number is the number of unit mass atom that are necessary to make one gram. Well, in this way, Avogadro number does not appear such an important number. But in few minutes, we will be seeing that the Avogadro number has a deeper meaning and a very, very, very important meaning. So wait for a moment, a little patience. Then, in matter, molecule is said the smallest part of a chemical compound that keeps all the properties of this compound itself. Namely, if we have a molecule of water, the molecule of water is composed by one atom of oxygen and two atoms of hydrogen. Namely, it is said they the molecule of water as a formula H2O. The molecule of water could be further decomposed if you perform an electrolysis of water, you are able to separate the oxygen of water from the hydrogen of water. So you may further decompose water. But when you detach the oxygen from hydrogen in water, oxygen and hydrogen resulting from electrolysis of water will, lost, will have lost the properties of water and will be different chemical compound. So 
the smallest part of a chemical compound that keeps all the properties of a chemical compound is a molecule. Okay? The molecular mass of a substance of a substance is the sum of the mass of the atoms that form a molecule. Namely, if we have a molecule of water, the molecule of water has a formula H2O. Namely, it's composed by two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. The molecular mass of water will be one atom of hydrogen, the weight, the atomic weight is one. Another atom of hydrogen, the atomic weight is one. So one plus one, two. One atom of oxygen, the atomic weight of oxygen is 16. 16 plus two, 18. So it is very, very easy to calculate the molecular weight of a molecule. In the uh, lesson of uh, exercise, you will see a lot of this calculation. Well, then we can say that elements are substances where all atoms are liquid, and compounds are substances formed by two or more different atoms. For example, water is a substance, a substance because there are hydrogen atom and oxygen atom. For example, chlorine is an elemental because chlorine has a molecule that has formula Cl2, namely is a diatomic molecule that is composed by two chlorine atoms, as well as hydrogen is another element because it is composed by molecules that has formula H2, namely there are only hydrogen atom. Look, here there is the example of the calculation of molecular mass of water. The molecular mass of a compound is indicated by a M with a capital M. So M H2O is one is the weight of an hydrogen atom, one is the weight of the second hydrogen atom, 16 is the weight of the oxygen atom, one plus one plus 16 equal 18. So 18 is the mass of the molecular mass of water. Then look at this. An amount of chemical substances that weighs its gram and number equal to the molecular mass is said mole. Namely, we have that the molecular mass of water is 18 units, unit atom mass. Namely, how much water you need to have a mole of water? The molecular weight is 18, so you need 18 grams. Namely, look, is an amount of chemical substances that weighs in gram a number equal to the molecular mass. The molecular mass is 18. Namely, 18 grams of water represent a mole of water. Okay? Obviously, the molar mass is the mass of a mole and is expressed in grams, whereas molecular mass is the mass of a molecule and is expressed in unit atom mass. But the number that represents molar mass or molecular mass is always the same. For water is 18, but if we are talking about molecular mass, 18 are unit atom mass. Whereas, if we are talking about mole mass, 18 are 
grams of water. Okay? Understood? Let's do another simple operation. Let's divide the mole mass, namely the mass of a mole of water, which is 18 grams, by the mass of a molecule of water, which is 18 unit atom mass. 18 and 18 disappear from this expression because they are simplified with each other. And we have one gram divided by one unit atom mass. But we already saw the result of this operation in the previous part of the lesson. And we saw that the ratio between one gram and one unit atom mass is 6.023 per 10, at 10, per 10 elevated at the 23. Namely, this is the Avogadro number. By defining the Avogadro number in this second way, we see the very, very, very large importance that assumes this chemical constant Avogadro number. Namely, the Avogadro number is you need 6.023 per 10 at elevated at the 23 molecules to form a mole of water. Namely, we can say that, we conclude that the Avogadro number is the number of molecules of a substances that is present in one mole of this substance. Okay? And this, this, uh, this definition will be valid always. So, we can say that the Avogadro number is the number of unit mass necessary to compose one gram, but this is not very important. But, and it is very important, the Avogadro number represents the number of molecules that are contained in one gram, in one mole of a substance. Namely, we can conclude that in one mole of substance, is always present an Avogadro number of molecules. Okay? Then, the number of moles of a substance is usually pointed by a small n. The mass of a substance is usually pointed by a, by a mole m. The molecular on the molar weight of a substance is pointed by a big M, a, a M in capital letter. Namely, these three quantities are related to each other by this relation. Namely, the number of moles is equal to the mass of a compound divided by the molecular or molar weight. Namely, if we have that the molecular, the molar weight of water is 18 grams, if we have 18 grams of water, it represents one mole. But if we have 36 grams of water, we have that these 36 grams of water represents 36 divided by 18 molar weight of water equal to moles of water. Obviously, also the reverse formula may be used. Namely, you have that the mass of a compound is equal to the number of mole multiplied by the mole mass, and also we have that the mole mass is equal to the mass of the compound divided by the number. Then I would like to show you another, another relation which is very often used in chemistry. You know, in chemistry, the density, which is usually represented as D, is defined as the mass on the volume unit. So, you have that 
the density d is equal to the ratio between the mass of a compound and the volume occupied by this compound. So you have this other relation, d equal m divided by v. Obviously also in this case the reverse formula are valid, namely the mass of a compound is equal to the uh, product of the volume of the compound by the density of the compound and also the volume of a compound is equal to the ratio between the mass of this compound divided by the density of this compound. Finally, and this will be the final part of this lesson, for example, Water as chemical formula H2O, methane as chemical formula CH4, hydrogen as chemical formula H2, ammonia as chemical formula NH3, sodium chloride as chemical formula NaCl, and uh, uh, silica, namely the, uh, silicon dioxide, as chemical formula SeO2. Well, chemical formula may have two different meanings. If a molecule of these substances may be isolated, may be determined, the formula represents the composition of the molecule. As an example, in water, when we say that the chemical formula of water is H2O, it means that the molecule of water is formed by an oxygen atom which is bound to two hydrogen atoms. As well as when we say that the methane formula is CH4, it means that the molecules of methane is, formula, is formed by one carbon atom which is bound to four different hydrogen atoms. As well as when we say that the ammonia formula is NH3, it means that the molecule of ammonia is formed by a nitrogen atom bound to three different hydrogen atom, okay? But there are also substances in which a molecule cannot be determined, cannot be isolated. <clears throat> substances in which it is not possible to isolate a, a, a molecule. As an example, sodium chloride NaCl and silica dioxide SCH2. You know, these compounds are solids. How sodium chloride appears? Does it appear? It appears as a solid composed by crystal. You know, if we would like to write the exact formula of sodium chloride, we should write NaXxClx, with X depending on, the, on how big is the crystal. Obviously, it does not have no meaning, because if we have a larger crystal, X is bigger. And if we have a smaller crystal, X is smaller. So it is useless to report this number. It does not give us no information. What is important in sodium chloride and what is, must be reported in the chemical formula is that the ratio of combination between sodium and chlorine is one to one. Namely, that for every sodium atom that is present in sodium chloride, there is present one chlorine atom. 
as well as in silicon dioxide. You know, silicon dioxide is the main compound that is present in the sand of the Dara in the beach, when the sand of the beach is quite clear. You know, the, the sand of the beach is formed by grains, and uh, the fact that there is the chemical formula on no silicon dioxide is S, S E O2, it means just that for every silicon atom, two different oxygen atoms are bound to this silicon atom. So, when it's not possible to determine a molecule in a chemical compound, the chemical formula gives only the ratio of combination of the atom of which the compound is formed. Okay? Finally, um, a last fact should be said. There are two different kinds of formula, the molecular formula and the empirical formula. Let's take a compound, the hydrogen peroxide. The hydrogen peroxide is commonly called oxygenated water. And the molecular formula of hydrogen peroxide is H2O2. You know, the empirical formula of hydrogen peroxide is HO. The difference what is? The difference is that the empirical formula gives only us the ratio of combination of the atom that compose the molecule, whereas the molecular formula gives us exactly the formula of the molecule. And we always have that the molecular formula is multiple of the empirical formula by a wall number. For example, the molecular formula of hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, whereas the empirical formula of hydrogen peroxide is H2. It means that two unit HO are present in a molecule of hydrogen peroxide and that the wall number uh, of, by which the empirical formula must be multiplied to obtain the molecular formula is exactly two. If we have, for example, another compound such as H2O, namely the formula of water, we have in this case that the molecular formula coincides with the empirical formula and also in this case we have that the molecular formula is a multiple of the empirical formula. The fact is that the wall number by which the molecular formula is a multiple of the empirical formula is just one. And in this case we have that the molecular formula coincides with the empirical formula. Well, the lesson is over now and uh, regarding molecular weight, regarding mole, regarding molecule, regarding all what it has been said during this lesson, you will do a lot of exercises. Okay? Well, see you tomorrow for a next lesson. Bye.